Uh, our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 119, and we are in uh, the second section of Psalm 119. Some of your Bibles might say Bet, which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's verses 9 through 16, and, and Jim's going to read that for us today. Keeping your word, I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be praised. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> what a wonderful question. How can a young man keep his way pure? Hide the Lord's word in your heart, think about it, and work diligently to keep it. And that's how a young man or a young woman is able to keep their way pure. Well, Father, again, we <clears throat> just thank you that <clears throat> we thank you that you have uh, called us your children. <clears throat> we thank you that you hear us. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you that we can, can gather as we have today and worship. And we just uh, think about <clears throat> the great love that you have shown to us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray, Lord, that as we, we think about that today, that we would grow in, in gratitude for you. We pray that we would grow in, in, in uh, respect and awe of you. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word that we can learn from you, that we can know you, and we can know what you want for us. We pray, Lord, that as we turn our attention now to hear from your word, that you would open our hearts and minds, that your spirit would be at work in us and, and through this gathering, that you would help us to see clearly what you're saying, uh, to recognize that you are a, a, a perfectly clear and simple communicator, but also to see that your word uh, speaks to us individually, shows us not only the, the way that we should go as, as your people, as a congregation, but directs the, the path of our, our lives individually as well. And so we ask, Lord, that you would uh, speak to each of us today, that we would be open to your message, and that we would take the conviction that you give us, and we would be obedient to you. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Now, as many of you know, we just finished up last week with the book of James. The folks who have been here know that we are uh, doing a few things over the next three weeks uh, specific to Easter. And the folks who haven't been here are finding that out today. I've put, on, put the schedule here on the board uh, for March. Today is the 17th. Uh, today we will be looking specifically at the death of Christ. We'll do that through Mark chapter 15 and his account in verses 21 through 39. Uh, next Sunday is the 24th, and that is uh, when, when Jesus entered Jerusalem uh, at the start of the Passover week, the triumphal entry. So we're going to take a look at that, and we'll be in uh, Matthew's account of it. 
on the 24th. Uh, Friday the 29th is Good Friday. We're going to have our normal uh, joint service with several of the other churches. This year it will be at Kitty Hawk Baptist Church at 6 p.m. I believe 6 p.m. is the time. I'll have to confirm that and, and let you know for sure closer to, but that's normally when it has been. Uh, so Good Friday will be the joint service on the 29th. And then on uh, the 31st, which is Easter Sunday, we'll be looking at the resurrection. And we'll be in John's account of that. So this is our schedule. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, looking at verses 21 through 39. Now, <clears throat> it's good <clears throat> this time of year to make a habit of remembering the events uh, which have occurred. You know, as, as, as a church, there, there are typically two times of year when we almost universally do, do specific things, uh, Christmas and Easter, right? Well, why is that? Why do, do we celebrate uh, the birth of Christ every year? Well, we want to remember exactly how God has sent His Son into the world. We want to remember this event. We want to be familiar with it. Why do we celebrate Easter? Well, again, we want to be very familiar with the events that occurred. They're crucial to the faith. So at this time of year, we make a habit of remembering these things. You know, what's interesting about that is uh, when God brought His people out of Egypt and He gave them the Passover, you know what He told them? He said, do this every year. And when your children ask you why you do this every year, explain to them that this is how God saved us from Egypt. You know, as Christians, we do the same thing. Every year we celebrate Christmas and Easter, and have your children ever asked you, well, why do we celebrate Christmas? Why do we celebrate Easter? Have you explained to them that this is how God has saved us? Right. So <clears throat> today, as I mentioned, we're going to look at Mark's account of Christ's death. And I want to point out that uh, not only are these events recorded history, right, but uh, again, they're essential to the faith, and so we want to be very familiar with them. My plan today is just to go through each section that we have here and discuss it. Uh, I don't really know of a better way to do it than that. Uh, so what I'd like you to do, uh, if you have your Bible, is open to Mark chapter 15. If you need a Bible, there's one on the seat tray in front of you. It's the white book. And let's, uh, let's open to Mark chapter 15. <clears throat> now, before we read, I want to remind you of the things that have been going on uh, right up to the point that we're going to join in at verse 21. Uh, some of you know these events very well. Overnight, Jesus has been arrested and he has been put on trial by the Jewish authorities. They have accused Jesus of claiming to be the Messiah. What is the Messiah? The Messiah is the deliverer, the king of the Jews. They've accused him of being the king of the Jews. They have convicted him of this in their court, and then very early in the morning they have brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate. Now, the Jews had already decided on a death sentence. Under Roman law, they were unable to carry that out themselves, so they had to get the Roman governor involved, and that's who Pontius Pilate is. He's the Roman governor. Pilate, however, could find no reason to put Jesus to death. The Jewish leaders, however, were insistent. This is what must happen. So Pilate turned the decision over to the crowd, right? It was Pilate's custom once a year to release a prisoner. He was holding a notorious revolutionary named Barabbas. <clears throat> Pilate was also holding Christ. Pilate asked the crowd, who do you want? Do you want me to release to you Barabbas, or do you want me to release to you the one who is called the king of the Jews? It was really surprising. I think for many of us, it was very surprising that the people in the crowd chose Barabbas, not Jesus. What should I do with Jesus? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. 
What has he done that deserves death? Pilate replied. Well, there was no real answer to that question that was given, right? This is kind of mob mentality. We're not going to think about it. We're just going to say what we want, right? The chief priests began stirring the crowd up, and they shouted more and more and louder and louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the Jewish people and probably wanting to avoid a riot that looked like it was about to break out, Pilate handed Jesus over to be flogged and nailed to a cross. <clears throat> now, at this point then, the Roman soldiers led Jesus away. They put a purple robe on him like a king would wear. They twisted together a, a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head. They called out to him, Hail, the king of the Jews. They spit on him and they beat him on the head repeatedly with a staff. This is after they had whipped him, scourged him. They spit on him and they made fun of him. Then the soldiers stripped Christ and they led him out to be executed. And that's where we pick up with verse 21. I've got it up here on the screen, <clears throat> and I'll read it as well. But this is, this is where we join in then at verse 21 of chapter 15. They, the they here is referring to the Roman soldiers, they forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon, a Cyrenian the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, some of you may know that Cyrene is present-day Libya, and Simon is a, a Jewish man who has come in to Jerusalem for the Passover, and as he's come in, he's being pressed into service uh, by the Roman soldiers. Then in verse 22, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place, they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get, what each of the soldiers would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. I want to st stop for a minute here because it's not surprising that the Roman soldiers forced this man Simon into service carrying Jesus' cross. After all, it's the, the cross bar is the piece that Jesus had to carry. It weighs over 100 pounds. And he had to walk a half mile from where he was out to the place where the crucifixion was to occur. And you think about the things that he's gone through already. Right? He has been kept up all night. He has uh, been run back and forth across town for the various trials that have taken place. Uh, he has been beaten now with a whip. He has been beaten on the head with a staff. Right? He's had a number of things happen where you've got to imagine he is physically exhausted. Right? He probably has a splitting headache. Right? And he is, is, is just not capable. He's not strong enough at this point physically to be able to carry uh, this large wooden beam. <clears throat> so it, it's not surprising that they need to uh, uh, get somebody from the crowd, uh, 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 somebody who's, who's standing there, uh, to, to do this. What may be surprising, however, is that when Jesus is offered myrrh mixed with wine, verse 23, he refuses it. Some of you might say, well, why is that strange? Well, some of you will, some, some people will tell you that, that myrrh is simply a perfume, that, it's, that it is uh, associated quite often with Jesus' death. And that's true. Myrrh was used uh, to perfume a body, uh, to embalm it, basically. But myrrh, when it's mixed with wine and you consume it, is actually a pain reliever. It's a narcotic. It's offered to men who are being crucified in order to numb their senses. 
uh, to send them off to la-la land, so to speak. And Jesus says no. You know, some of you are, are, are my age or older or close to my age, and you may remember the advertisements that used to be on TV all the time, saying no to drugs, right? Just say no to drugs. When I was a kid, they ran these ads all the time. And, you know, you have like uh, this, this hot frying pan that you see on the stove, and somebody takes an egg, and they say, this is your brain. And they crack the egg, and they put it in the frying pan. They say, this is your brain on drugs, right? Any questions? That's probably a large reason why I never did any drugs as a kid, because I just kept thinking about, that's your brain. That's your brain on drugs. I don't have, I don't, don't have any questions about that. <laughs> you know, there are times in this life when we will be in pain, and there are times in this life when we will be physically exhausted, when we will be emotionally distressed, when we will be spiritually burdened. Right? There are times... Um, uh, when there's going to be a temptation to, uh, to escape, to, to seek pain relief. Now, it's not like there's something necessarily wrong with pain relievers in the sense that you think about, well, somebody going into surgery. Well, they certainly don't need to feel that, do they? Right? Or what about somebody who is, is, is recovering and, and for their, their body to actually heal uh, properly, you, you need, to, you need to, to administer some of these these drugs for those purposes, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But there is a problem with seeking to escape this life. There is a problem with seeking to escape the things that God has, has, has purposed for us to go through. You know, there's, there's often a very human desire for pain relief in difficult circumstances to, to, to numb the pain, to just get away from it for a while. Christ is going through a number of things here where you would say there should be a, a temptation to, to, to uh, avoid this, right? In just a few moments, it's going to get much worse, and he knows it. He's going to have uh, uh, nails the size of railroad ties, basically, driven through his hands and his feet, and he's going to be hung on this cross... Uh, in order to uh, suffocate, to die by, by asphyxiation. All of the things that Christ is going through already and all of the things that he knows he's about to go through, he chooses not to escape, but he chooses instead to have a clear mind. And that should be very challenging to some of us when we think about the various situations in our own lives where we have this temptation to just get away from it for a little while. <clears throat> In verse 24, we're told that Jesus was crucified and, and that the soldiers divided Jesus' clothes by casting lots. <clears throat> you know, crucifixion was basically the annihilation of a person. We don't have a lot of details about exactly what happened to Jesus. There was no need to give these kind of details to uh, Mark's readers. They knew exactly what Roman crucifixion was like. God has chosen not to give us those details, even though we may not be very familiar with it. There's no need to, to, to recount the horrors of this process. But what we do want to understand is that this was basically the annihilation of a person. It took not only their life, but it also took their dignity and even the shirt on their back. Jesus' clothes have been taken by the soldiers and are being divided among them. <clears throat> the last of Jesus' earthly possessions are his clothing, likely an outer garment and an undergarment, a belt, a pair of sandals, something to that nature is what they're, they're dividing. It was the right of the soldiers in the execution squad to claim whatever possessions the person being put to death had remaining. These are being divided by casting lots, and it is exactly what the Scripture said was going to happen. I want to read to you from Psalm 22, beginning at verse 14. You don't have to turn there in your Bible if you don't want to, but it would be worthwhile to read this at some point for yourself. <clears throat> Psalm 22, beginning at verse 14, 
And I want you to keep in mind that this was written close to a thousand years before the events here happened. I am poured out like water and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evil doers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. And then verse 18. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. You know, what is happening here fulfills the scriptures. This is exactly what this was written about. In verses 25 through 28, we're given some more details, and so I'd like to, to pick up with those. <clears throat> uh, beginning at verse 25, we're told that uh, it was now nine in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge written against him was the king of the Jews. They crucified him two criminals with him, one on his left and one on his right. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, and he was counted among the outlaws. You know, verse 25 gives us the time when Jesus was crucified, 9 a.m. Some of your Bibles might say the third hour of the morning. Well, the third hour of the morning is 9 a.m. Both Jews and Romans counted the day from sunup to sundown. 6 a.m. is what they considered the start of the day, the first hour of the day, and so the third hour of the day is 9 a.m., right? Verse 26 gives us the official charge against Jesus, King of the Jews. It's very normal to have the, the charge sheet, so to speak, uh, the, the conviction that's handed down by the court, what is the reason that this person is, 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 is being sentenced or what is the reason for their, for their uh, uh, punishment, to have that published. And that was published on the cross. He was convicted of being the king of the Jews. That charge is correct, but not in the sense that they intend it, right? Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king of the Jews. They... They, it's, this is meant more in a, a, a political sense. The words are right, but the intention uh, is, is not quite there. <clears throat> Verse 27 tells us that Jesus was crucified along with two criminals, or some of your Bibles might say robbers. The word in Greek that's translated as robber can mean a robber or it can simply mean a criminal. Verse 28 lets us know that this happened in fulfillment of the Scripture, that Jesus was counted among the outlaws. Now, we want to be very clear here that Jesus is not a criminal. He is not an outlaw. He is completely without sin. He has lived according to all of God's laws. Both Herod and Pilate could find no fault with Christ when they examined Him but he has been counted among the outlaws. He has been, he's being put to death with criminals. Why is that? So that we can be counted as righteous in him. The scripture that's being referenced here is Isaiah chapter 53, and it's verses 11 through 12. <clears throat> My righteous servant will justify many. He will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the many as a spoil, because he has submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels, was counted among the outlaws. He bore the sin of the many and interceded for them. You know, right here is the good news. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We know this, right? Many of us don't need to be convinced of our sins. Every single one of us needs to be saved. There's no person who has always done what is right and never sinned. The scripture is very clear about these things. No one except for Jesus. 
You know, our sins make us criminals in God's court. Uh, as soon as we are able, we choose for sin, and we become guilty uh, 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 of the crime, right? We become counted as a rebel. God demands a perfect life from each one of us. The problem is that when we get there and we have to present that to Him, we can't do it, right? Why is that? Well, not one of us has one. You know, some people, as I mentioned, uh, know very well what they have done. They don't need to be convinced that they have sinned. They don't need to be convinced that this or that thing that they've done uh, was wrong. Others might say, well, well, my sins really aren't that bad. In fact, I'm not really even sure they are sins. I mean, you think about the, the man who, who went to Jesus and said, oh, uh, how, do you enter, how, do you, how do you inherit eternal life? Well, keep the commands. Well, I've kept all the commands. Are you sure about that? You know, some people will say, well, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't stolen. Uh, I, I haven't done anything like that. I haven't done the really bad stuff. Well, have you, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever wanted something that someone else had? Have you ever thought, oh, I really hate that person? Maybe you didn't say it, but it was there in your mind. It was in your heart. All right, big or small, Christ has gone to the cross for all of our sins. He has said, lay those charges on me. Right? I'll offer my perfect life in their place. I'll take responsibility for what they have done. I will take the punishment. I will pay the price. That's what he's done. He said, count me as a criminal so they can go free. You know, this is the love of God, that He does not want any one of us to perish. What He actually wants is that all would come to repentance. He doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to repent and to be forgiven. He wants us to trust in Christ. He knows that not everyone will, but that doesn't change the fact that His desire is that we would be forgiven rather than punished. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but should have eternal life instead. Many of us know that by heart, John 3.16. You know, this is the reason that Jesus is on the cross. He is offering His life in our place. He is being counted as an outlaw so that we can go free. He is being counted as a criminal so that we can be counted righteous in Him. You know, the sad thing is that many of those in the crowd don't understand this. They don't, it's happening right before them, but they don't see it. Just like today when people make fun of Christians, when they say, oh, prove that there's a heaven and a hell. When they say, or, or, or prove that Jesus is God, you know. Many of those here watching this happen are acting the exact same way. Look at verses 29 through 32. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 29, we're told that those who passed by, those who are walking by, right? This is an, an outdoor public spectacle, right? Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! The one who would demolish the sanctuary and build it in three days. Look at this guy. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes were mocking him to one another and saying, Well, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. And even those who were being crucified with Christ, even those two men on either side of him, in no different position than he was, as far as anybody else could tell, even they were taunting him. You know, at this point, we should be very upset with these people. Right. How many of you are feeling upset with these people? Why kick a man when he's down? <clears throat> don't they know it's the Lord they are insulting? 
Didn't Jesus do enough miracles already to prove himself? Yes, Jesus did plenty of miracles already to prove himself. He has already clearly told them who he is several times, and Jesus has been fulfilling the scriptures, which should have shown them very clearly that he was sent by God. Well, don't they know that when Jesus said, I will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, he wasn't talking about the building in the middle of Jerusalem. He was talking about the temple of his body. He was talking about his death on the cross right here and then his coming resurrection. Don't they know that? You know, if you understand that these are people who really know their Bibles and probably better than most of us do, you should be very surprised. You might wonder, how can they be so blind? Well, even this was predicted in God's Word. Let me read to you from Psalm 22 again, uh, verses 6 through 8. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let the Lord rescue him since the Lord takes pleasure in him. Does that sound familiar? Let me point out that we still have people like this today. They see someone else who is in agony. They see someone who uh, seems to be helpless or weak. right? And instead of compassion and sympathy, they are instead filled with pride. They make fun of them, right? Sometimes these people look like they've got it all together. Sometimes these people look like they're at the top of society. Sometimes these people look like they are the religious elite. And other times they are in no better position themselves, apparently, than the person they're making fun of. In either case, they are doing this to make themselves feel good. They are doing it... Uh, because uh, it makes them feel like they have some, some kind of power, right? Uh, but the reality is that they, they actually do not. They themselves are in a very de desperate position. They may not realize it, but their pride has put them in a very, very difficult place. You know, if you've ever been on the receiving end of this, I want you to understand that our Lord has been too. If you've ever been the person who was mocked, ridiculed, put down, Jesus has been there too. Be patient. Don't retaliate. And don't come down to their level. You know, I remember being made fun of one time when I was a kid. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money from time to time. There was a time that we didn't have a lot of money and I needed new shoes and my mom got them from the flea market. Anybody here know what a flea market is? Some people don't know what a flea market is. I was really surprised. Um, you know, it, it's just, people go and they sell all kinds of things, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's a cheap place to get stuff, the flea market. <clears throat> well, my neighbor down the street saw my no-name shoes, and he was making fun of me. Well, the fact of the matter is, we lived in the same neighborhood. Our families were in the same situations. His shoes actually were no better than mine, but he was making fun of me. I wanted to say all kinds of nasty things to him, but you know what my mom told me? She said, don't stoop to his level. Right? Don't stoop to his level. You know, the truth of the matter is that Christ can come down from the cross. He could do that if he wanted to. He certainly is capable of doing that. <clears throat> I mean, he is the maker of the heavens and the earth, right? He is the Lord. He could have called down 12 legions of angels to stop his arrest. He could smite all those who are... Are, are, are saying these things if he wanted to do that. Instead, he's giving his life for them too. Right? Uh, he could say enough is enough, and he could literally come down off the cross, but he does not do that. 
they say he has saved others, but he will not save himself or he cannot save himself. Well, the fact of the matter is he would not save anyone else if he did come down off the cross. He would not save anyone if he saved himself, so he will not do it. Why? Well, because that's not how redemption works. If Jesus saves himself, he will not pay for our sins. The whole reason that he is there is to pay for our sins. If he would save himself, none of us would be saved. It's as simple as that. And so he's not going to do it. I feel like I should make some kind of Dana Carvey joke. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. All right, that's, that's enough of that. <clears throat> He's not going to do it. In verse 33, we want to pick up here with verse 33 through 36. Because we're, we're, we're shown here exactly what's going on while Jesus is bearing the sins of the world. Uh, in verse 33, it says that when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. And then someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a reed, and said, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. And we're told in verse 33 that darkness came over the land for three hours. During this time, Jesus is bearing the sin of the world. What's talked about by darkness coming over the land is that the sun was covered up. In the middle of the day, from noon until three, you could not see the sun in the sky. Darkness came over the land. It's no surprise that while Jesus is bearing the sin of the world, the light of the world, the actual sun in the sky, is not visible. It's blotted out. Right? You think about the blackness of sin and what's going on. It's not a surprise. At the end of this time, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 34. Now, some people teach here that at this point in time, Jesus is covered with the sins of humanity. God is so holy that he cannot look upon sin. And so the Father turns his face away from the Son turns his face away from Christ, cannot look at him. And this is why Jesus feels abandoned. This is why he feels forsaken. Uh, and certainly in his humanity, Christ must have felt forsaken. You may think of yourself here and how you sometimes feel when you are in sin. Sometimes you feel distant from God. Sometimes you feel uh, far away from him. In his divinity, however, Christ can never be separated from the Father. We know that, uh, the, that God is three persons who are one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've always existed together, and in their divine union, they can never be separated. In salvation, Christ shares his relationship to the Father with us. And it's a good reminder here because even when we are in sin, we are not forsaken by God. As God's children, He never abandons us nor forsakes us. Christ has promised to be with us always, even until the end of the age. At the moment of saving faith, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit never departs from us. Certainly, any time that we feel abandoned, any time that we feel forsaken as God's children, this is certainly only in our minds. God has not gone anywhere. He is still right there, and He will never reject the one He has accepted in Christ. The words that Jesus is speaking from the cross are the first verse of Psalm 22, and I want to, to read these to you. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from the words of my groaning? My God, I call out by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest. Verse 2. Have you ever felt this way? That you're groaning and you're suffering and you're calling out to God and you feel like He's not answering or you feel that He's distant from you? While the beginning of this psalm expresses the feeling of abandonment, uh, it actually concludes with a reminder of God's constant presence and the fact that He's always with His children. Uh, it's titled, actually, From Suffering to Praise. And if you would get down to verse 24, it says, All you who fear the Lord praise Him. He has not despised the suffering of His afflicted one. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. Jesus is confident of his place with the Father. Jesus is confident, even in the midst of of what's going on, that his Father hears him. He is confident that he is still accepted by his Father. And he wants those around to understand what is actually going on. Something I'll mention here is that the children of God really need to learn the difference between the accusations of Satan and the convictions which come from the Holy Spirit. You know, Satan enjoys making accusations against us for our sin. He delights in taking the joy of forgiveness from us. He wants us to feel ashamed, and He wants us to feel distant from the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit will not show you your sins, and I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit wants you to continue in any of your sins, because He certainly does not. But as He shows us our sins, He also shows us the love and the forgiveness of Christ at the same time. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 tells us, speaking about Joshua, the high priest. Then he, the angel of the Lord, showed me the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this man not a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. See, I have removed your guilt from you and will clothe you with splendid robes. You know, each one of us is a brand snatched from the fire. We are standing in filthy clothes, yet we have Christ uh, standing there at the same time saying, this one is mine, right? Through Christ, we have entered into a relationship of grace with God, not condemnation. Satan accuses, but Christ says, this one is covered in my blood. Now, some people in the crowd, I want to get back to what we're reading here. Some people in the crowd mistake what Jesus is saying, and they think that he's calling for Elijah, verse 35. You might wonder, well, how how did they come up with that? Eloi sounds a lot like Elijah. Jews believed that Elijah was something like a saint. You know, if you think about how saints work in the Catholic Church, they're a little closer to us than God. Maybe they've got a little more time available than he does, and they've got some grace, and so maybe I'll just call on them and they'll help me out here, right? The Jews thought about Elijah much the same way. You could call on him and get some help if you were in distress. And so they say, oh, he's calling for Elijah. Well, let's see if Elijah comes to get him, right? Now, they may have also misunderstood Jesus because his throat is parched. John tells us that at this point in time, Jesus said he was thirsty. Uh, Someone here offers Jesus wine vinegar to drink, verse 36, and, and this is something else which fulfills the Scripture. Psalm 69 says, They gave me gall for my food and vinegar for my drink. 
Now, vinegar might not seem refreshing to many of us. I don't know if you've ever had vinegar to drink. This is diluted with water, so it's much more palatable. Uh, then after this, Jesus calls out in a loud voice, and he dies. And we see this in the last few verses here, 37 through 39. <clears throat> But Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite Christ saw the way he breathed his last, he said, this man really was God's son. This man really was God's son. You know, we want to understand here that Jesus is not some sort of helpless victim. The idea sometimes is, oh, look at all the terrible things that happened to Jesus. Look what they did to him. And, and, and we, we think of him in some sense as a, as a helpless victim. And that's not the case. Jesus breathed his last, verse 37, is literally gave up his spirit. We know in other accounts that at this same time he said, it is finished. It is complete. Everything is done. It is paid in full. Jesus did not die because his organs failed. He did not die because his body quit working. Jesus gave up his spirit because the atonement was complete. Before going to the cross, Jesus said, I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it up again. He has laid his life down willingly because all of the work of atoning for sin on the cross is done. He said, no one takes it from me, I give it freely. At this same time, we see in verse 38 that the veil in the temple was torn. Now, the veil in the temple is the curtain that separates the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, from the rest of the temple. And that curtain, if any of you know, is about 80 feet high, and it's made out of material that's woven together in such a way it's about as thick as your fist. This was torn in two from top to bottom. There is no human hand that could have done this. It is understood that God's presence left the temple at this time, at that moment, and that the Old Covenant was ended. Now, the curtain being torn would have been witnessed by a great number of priests who were working in the temple at that time. The exact time that uh, Mark gives us for when this occurred was the exact time that the priests would have been in the temple preparing the sacrifices for the evening. Sacrifices were offered daily. The evening sacrifices were being prepared at that time. There would have been a large number of priests working in the temple who saw this. We're told in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that many of them came to saving faith. Observing this, no doubt, would have contributed greatly to that. Now, what we should understand here is that the final sacrifice has taken place. Sin has been atoned for once and for all. And any person, no matter who you are, is now able to come to the Lord directly through Christ. Then verse 39 tells us that the centurion, the Roman, the, the, the pagan, the Gentile who was standing there observed something, realized something that many many Jews failed to see. Surely this man was the Son of God. Now you might say, well, okay, so what, what does all of this come down to? What, is it, what does it all, re all really mean? Well, there are some very important things that we want to understand here, and they may be very simple for many of us. Jesus is the Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our King. The word means both. He is our Savior and He is our King. He gave His life on the cross for our sins. He is the Son of God, and He did actually die. You know, the death of Christ, just like His life and resurrection, are essential to our faith. 
the death of Christ is very well documented. We're going to get into uh, some of that in successive weeks, just as, as his life is very well documented. But the fact of the matter is, it is not the life of Christ that brings us to God. It is his death that does that. Well, how so, you might say? We know that his resurrection proves that he is who he said he was. We know that it proves what he did on the cross was perfect and complete. We know that because he lives, we also live and will have eternal life. We know that we will be raised from the dead. We know all of these things because of Christ's life and his resurrection. But his life without his death would actually separate us from God. It would shut us out. It would close the door completely. Do you know that? Because Christ's perfect, sinless life would only further condemn us unless He had laid it down in our place. It would only show us that we are still sinners. It would only show us that God only accepts perfection. It would only show us that we absolutely can never make it on our own. That's what His life without his death, would do. But Christ's death is what has opened the door for us. It shows that our sins are forgiven. It shows us the love, the mercy, and the acceptance of God. And if you are going to be a Christian, you not only have to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, but you must also believe something else. You must believe that Christ died, and specifically, you must believe that Christ died for you. You know, the reason for Christ's death was to pay for our sins, yours and mine. And the only way you're saved is through personal faith. You know, there are plenty of people who believe that Christ lived. There are plenty of people who believe that Christ died. There are plenty of people who will even tell you that Christ died for sins yet they are not saved. Why are they not saved? Because they don't put their sins on the cross. They don't recognize that Christ died for me. You know, personal faith believes it was also your sins nailed to that cross. Personal faith recognizes I am a sinner who needs to be saved, and Christ has done that for me. There's one important thing that we need to come away with today, and it's this. <clears throat> Only saving faith says Christ died for me. There's plenty of faith out there that says Christ lived. There's plenty of faith that says Christ lived and died. There's plenty of faith that says Christ lived, died, and was raised again. But until you put yourself as one of those people whom Christ has died for, you do not have saving faith. So the only question I'd like to leave you with today is this. Do you believe that Christ died for you? Praise God. <clears throat>